guys all for coming today. Just want to welcome the Holy Spirit right now into this place of worship. Holy Spirit, come. We invite you into this place. We invite you into our hearts, Lord. We set aside this time right now, Lord, to worship you and honor you. Make space for you, Lord. I pray that you would move upon every heart, Lord. That every person who came here, Lord God, would get everything that they desire to get from you, Lord. An encounter with you, Lord. And filled with your presence, Lord. They would feel a tangible presence with them, in them. Strengthening them and equipping them, Lord God. I just bless this time, Lord. name, Jesus, that we gather here. Amen. So I just want to share my heart with you guys. Um, I was praying for all of you guys this morning, and I really felt like the Lord was telling me, um, you know, love, it's my love that I want to reach all of you guys, my perfect love, because perfect love casts out all fear. And I want to read you a small passage um, out of Corinthians. It says, For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were from noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. For God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and our redemption. Therefore, let no if anyone boasts, may he boast in the Lord. And it's this love, it's this love, it's this um, love of God that sometimes just seems really foolish, really foolish to um, the world, but this love is the love that God loves us with, um, the love that says, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you, if anybody slaps you on the cheek, turn the other cheek also, it's like, how do you make sense of this, you know, the love that God tells us to have, um, you know, for other people, but even the love that he has for us, that in while we were sinners, he died for us. While we were, you know, afar from him, he loved us and he brought us in close in that love. And so I just wanted to share with you guys just some things that I wrote down after those verses. You see, this is a love that cannot be comprehended with the mind. It must be received with the heart. Even if you try to wrap your brain around it, you can't. It's foolishness, it's foolishness to your mind. Unconditional, never-ending love of God is foolishness to the world. The love that says, even after you rejected me so many times, I still desire you. I still draw near to you. I still run after you. I wait every single day for you to come home. And as I see you off in the distance, I run to you and I embrace you as my own. You are my beloved child whom I dearly love. And so I saw a picture. I saw... Um, I saw the prodigal son off in the distance, and I saw him, you know, just really repent and say, what am I going to say to my dad? What do I do? What do I say, you know? And the father sees him far away, and before he can even think about anything, he just runs to him, runs to him, and he just sweeps him up in his arms, and he just holds him, and he reminds him of who he is. You know, he's not, he's not there to judge him. He's not there to condemn him. He's not there to say, why did you do this? Why did you sin against me? All these things. No, it's actually the opposite. He just he just wants to love him. He just wants to bring him in. Um, and so when I was when I was seeing that, when I was thinking about that, I was thinking about Jesus, and I saw Jesus as a massive flashlight. Like you know, like when we're in dark, when it's dark, and we go get a flashlight, and all we can see is like you know, right in front of us or whatever. I saw Jesus as a massive flashlight. That once when we were in darkness, like literally he shined his light and immediately the face of the Father was before us. And the Father's face was looking down on us and showing his love for us and really just loving us 
so much, so purely. And it's, it's through Jesus that we get to see the face of the Father. It's through Jesus' love as well that he illuminates the face of the Father to us. And it's not from this place of like, oh, he's mad at me, he's judging me, he's so wrathful. It's from this place of, he loves me. He loves me. Even when I was a sinner, even if I run away from him, he still loves me. It's an unconditional love that never ends. It's a pure heart. It's a pure heart of love. So if there's anybody in here that that doesn't know that love that the Father has for them, that's my prayer for you guys today, is that you would know the love of the Father, the unconditional love that doesn't look at your sin, that doesn't look at any shame, that doesn't look at all of your past. He just says that He loves you, that He loves you with unconditional love. And He just wants you to come to Him. So I just pray that right now. Father, reveal your heart to your children. Reveal your unconditional love for them, Lord. And from this place, Lord God, I pray that they would see the truth and that they would be free, Lord, to love you in return. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
spoke a word you sing it over me you've been so so good to me before I took a breath you be your life
We thank you for them. We ask you, Lord, now that as they go upstairs, Lord, to learn about you and Jesus the Messiah, Lord, we pray that you, God, would just touch their hearts, that they would understand this message, Lord, that they would receive it as their own, Lord, and they would be changed by it. God, I pray that you would encounter the kids, Lord, with your heart, with your love. And I just bless them right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you guys. Song. Play a song for the Lord called Circles. You guys are welcome. You've never heard it before because uh, it's a new song. Feel free to let it minister to you or sing along or uh, meditate and soak in the, in the words and lyrics. Father, I just pray that uh, nobody would leave here today without sensing the tangible yes. substance of your love. It's a real thing, Lord. Your, your love is so much more real than even the furniture we're sitting on. It's so amazing. We open up our hearts to you, Lord. We open up our minds. And we say, Holy Spirit, let us experience the love of God today on a deeper, deeper level. We choose to focus on you. We focus our hearts on you. We give you our worship this morning. With all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we, we declare that Jesus is King. Jesus is Lord. And Lord, any area of our lives, any part of us that's not yet surrendered to you, reveal to us your goodness in that area so that we can yield, so that we can have more of you, Lord. More of you.
like sand in the palm of your hand.
tell sweet sound say the wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found blind but now I see hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave and all throughout eternity our song
Lord. Laura and I have been getting lost this week. We've been getting lost. Okay. Is this good? Is this a good spot? How about this? <laughs> I can take this anywhere. I mean, I can preach to you everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, blinds. Tyler, you mind hitting that blind for me, man? Pulling it to the left. Maybe we get these yeah. guys on. Turn on the lights. Turn on the lights. Turn on the lights. Oh, you gave my sermon title away. Well, that was a while ago. Keep trying to surprise you guys. <laughs> Something unique, you know. Um, it's been hard to focus this week. Yeah, I've been getting in the Word and just getting like wrapped up in God's love and affection. Literally this morning, I was in my closet trying to go over this sermon. I didn't even get. I didn't even go over it. I just worshipped and hung out with God. Um, how many of you know what I mean by getting lost in the Lord? He's our hiding place. We have to purposefully lose ourselves in Him. Sometimes, it, sometimes there's no pull. Sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes it's hard. This week for me personally was a difficult week. I was dealing with difficult people. And I had to fight to, to slip away into the presence of God and say, God, help me. Help me in life. Help me in the workplace because this week is uncomfortable for me. And it wasn't the best of weeks to... Just kind of ease on into Sunday and be able to worship and, you know, even get in the Word. But the love of God is more powerful than that. The love of God is more powerful than the way that we feel. And this week for me, I had to stir myself up and get into the presence of God regardless of feelings. It's not always easy. It's not always easy, but how much stuff do we do that's not based on feelings? We don't always feel like doing stuff that we know is good for us, but we do it. I know some of you in here love going to the gym, like my wife. <laughs> She loves working out. You probably love working out. You have you have fun doing it? No? He doesn't have fun, but he does it. Oh, I I just don't like working out. <laughs> there ain't no feelings for me whatsoever in working out. Just pain and boringness. I mean, so yeah, I just got to get to the gym for some reason. I just got to do it. But I don't know. Maybe the feelings will come. But <clears throat> um, there is a place in God where we can feel Him and we can experience Him. It's legitimate. It's it's real. It is real. Um, I feel like naked today for some reason. <laughs> I feel really exposed. I don't know what the deal is. It's different. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, Lord, Lord, you're good. Um, for Lord and I, the presence of God has become more enjoyable than anything we've ever had. Laura and I have had substances, we've had relationships, we've had things, we've had forms of entertainment. I mean, just none of it satisfies anymore. None of it satisfies. We just, we just want God. We just want to love God. And literally, it's our prayer that, um, it's our prayer that for those of you who come on Sundays, no matter what's going on with me and Laura in our intimacy with Christ, whether it looks weird or awkward or doesn't look normal, um, then we wouldn't judge one another. And we don't want to judge anybody who comes in here. We're all at different places in our relationship with the Lord. And we pray that every one of you that comes would be touched by the goodness of God, wherever you're at, whatever age you're at, where, however much of the Bible you've read, however long you've been a Christian, that everybody would be touched wherever they're at by the goodness of God. Of God. Um, and that God would, God would overwhelm us. God would overwhelm us with His goodness. And um, as we were talking and praying about what, what to discuss this week, Laura and I both were feeling the same thing. Um, we just want to talk about the love of God real simply. God's love. God's love. And um, last week we talked about consecrating ourselves, putting our lives on the altar because of a revelation of how good God is. And then His fire consumes us as a result of that. Jesus says, I have a baptism that I long to baptize you with. It's a baptism of fire. The baptism of water cleanses us from sin. The baptism of fire empowers us to live in intimacy with God. 
and after we get the fire, we get to experience this ongoing pleasure and love and intimacy with God himself. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. I was praying where to, where to go this week in the Word, and the, I felt the Lord immediately tell me John 21, verses 15 through 17. You guys want to open that? John 21, <clears throat> verses 15 through 17. Hey, Dominic, do you mind hitting that switch right there? Just turn on this light and let it in. Uh, next one. Boom. Yes, yes. John 21, verse John 21. John and we actually referenced this verse last, last week when we talked about the fire of God, how Jesus came, He was resurrected, came back from the dead, and then He goes on to the shore and He tells all the disciples out on the boat, cast your nets on the other side. They've been fishing all night, and they cast their nets on the other side, they catch 150 fish, the nets are barely holding on. And they go back to shore, they know it's the Lord, and He kindled the fire. And he's cooking bread and fish. Okay, so the presence of fire indicated the presence of God, the presence of the new covenant. And that's that's where we're at now. We're ending, we ended on that last week. We're picking it up now on this section um, in John 21, 15 through 17. Now, after they had had breakfast, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you burn with love for me more than these? Peter answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I have great affection for you. Then take care of my lambs, Jesus said. Jesus repeated his question the second time. Simon, son of John, do you burn with love for me? Peter answered, yes, my Lord. You know that I have great affection for you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. Then Jesus asked him again, Peter, son of John, do you have great affection for me? And Peter was saddened by being asked the third time and said, my Lord, you know everything. You know that I burn with love for you. And Jesus replied a third time, Then feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. A very interesting verse here. There's all sorts of speculation on why three times. And that's my primary question coming to the scripture. Why three times? Why does Jesus have to ask him three times? If you go back through the Gospels, Jesus did not always repeat things. His time was limited on earth. He had a mission to fulfill. He did not have time to continually repeat things so people could get it. He'd speak in a parable, and he'd expect the person to understand it. If they didn't understand it, he would, he would speak that night on the revelation and the meaning of that parable. And if you weren't paying attention, you just wouldn't get stuff. You had to follow Jesus and listen to what he was saying. He did not always repeat things. But here, he's kindled a fire, and he's talking to Peter, and he takes the time to ask Peter three times. And that's my begging question. Why did Jesus ask Peter three times? Uh, in one sense, I think it's a glimpse of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus is asking on behalf of all three persons of the Godhead. Um, some, some people think that the three questions are there because Peter denied Jesus three times, and three is a perfect limit that God allows something to happen in our lives. So Peter denied Jesus days earlier three times, and Jesus is asking him in response to redeem each denial. It's possible. 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 Um, when I first read through this verse a while ago, part of me wished that this was sort of a chant, like in sports or cheering. You know, you say things repetitively. You, you know, you got the disciples all around, and, and you got um, a, a crowd of disciples, and Peter's right there. He says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you, Lord. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you, Lord. Peter, do you love me? And everyone's cheering, okay? But that's not the case, because of verse 17, Peter is grieved. If this was a cheer or a chant, that was meant to build up the atmosphere and the disciples, Peter wouldn't have been grieved at the third time. Peter was painfully grieved at the third question. The third question got to a very uncomfortable level inside of Peter. <clears throat> so it wasn't a cheer, even though I think that would have been cool. Jesus cheering on his disciples on the beach. Um, but this was purely... An interaction of love between Jesus and Peter. This was a very intimate moment. And the reason, uh, so I was asking God in my prayer time, why three times? And when I study, I do not go to commentaries and I do not go to other people's books. I want to hear the Lord myself. I, want, I believe the Holy Spirit is with us. He teaches us. He reveals things to us. 
and I, and I know, I sense when the Lord speaks to me, there's a deep conviction and sort of like an inhaling of understanding when I'm in the Word. So I asked the Lord, I feel like He answered me, and as He answered me, gave me the answer to my question, why did He ask Him three times, I felt the answer. I felt it. Okay, and when I got the answer, when I was sitting on my computer reading the Word and I got the answer, I felt it and I cried. And I felt not only what the Lord was saying, but I felt the presence of the Lord. And what's going on here is the three questions reveal something about Peter's nature and it reveals something about Jesus' nature. It reveals something about Jesus' nature. Okay? Jesus is a Redeemer. Jesus is a Redeemer. He basically said, he, as a Redeemer, He goes to the root and cause of all sin. He stares death in the face and He says, I'm going to extract the value out of something that seemingly has no value. Death holds no value. That is, unless Jesus uses it as a means to liberate those in bondage to it. Apart from Jesus, death is death, but with Jesus, death is life. Jesus was crushed by death so that He could render it powerless over us. So Jesus is unveiling to us what role He plays as a Redeemer here in this repetitive questioning of Peter's love for Him. Now check out Zechariah 10, 6-8. This will give us an idea of how God acts as Redeemer. <clears throat> and it's cool because all throughout Scripture, that phrase Redeemer, that title Redeemer is only given to God. Only God has the ability to redeem somebody. And, and I looked this up, I, uh, I looked up the definition of this word in the American English Dictionary, and usually you'll get a thesaurus or different uh, root meanings of the word or different ways of saying the word or examples. And in the American English Dictionary, there's only one example to define the word Redeemer, and it just said Christ. Wow. Even the American English Dictionary can't find any other way to truly define the word Redeemer because it was originally only found in Scriptures. And it particularly uh, pertains to Jesus. Here's an Old Testament verse where the Lord prophesies His redemption of people. I will strengthen the house of Judah... And I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back because I have compassion on them. And they shall be as though I had not rejected them. For I am the Lord their God and I will answer them. Next section. Then Ephraim shall become like a mighty warrior and their hearts shall be glad as with wine. Their children shall see it and be glad. Their hearts shall rejoice in the Lord. Next section. This is my favorite part of what it means to, re to what it means to redeem. Whistle. I I do this with my kids when I can't get their attention with my voice when we're at the park or something. And Judah, Iris, not listening. <whistles> Just whistle, and they automatically respond to it. And it's so cool. The Old Testament passage says, "God says, I'll whistle for them and gather them in, for I've redeemed them, and wow. they shall be as many as they were before." It's kind of like what Jesus is doing here on the beach with the. It's a he doesn't necessarily whistle, but he says, hey, throw your net on the other side. And it's a signal that goes out from Jesus that the disciples automatically recognize. A miracle of catching fish, that's Jesus back there. We need to run to him. Galatians 3.13, this, this also shows in the New Testament what it means to redeem. Yet Christ paid the full price to set us free from the curse of the law. He absorbed it completely as he became a curse in our place. For it is written, everyone who is hung upon a tree is doubly cursed. In history, the worst way to die was being crucified. You were considered cursed two times if you were killed that way. And Jesus became a curse so that he could take the curse off of us. Wow. All throughout Scripture, God is referred to as the Redeemer. And Jesus comes onto the shore, and he's fulfilling that prophecy now. He is now able, because he's taken death, because he's redeemed the destruction of death and taken it upon himself, He's now able to redeem that in every individual, no matter how dark their past is, no matter their mistakes. So, think of it this way, Peter's responses, okay? First time, Peter's excited, he just hustled onto the shore, just caught 150 fish, recognizes Jesus getting ready to eat a meal with the Lord, he answers out of sheer thrill of the moment. Any of you guys ever been asked a question, and you don't even think about your response, you're just excited in the moment, you say, yeah, I'll do it, you know? Yeah, totally, I agree with that. And you're just answering out of a circumstantial perspective, okay? 
And then you go home later that day and you're like, wow, I didn't really think about my answer to that question. It was just, you know, kind of in the moment that I did that. Second time, Peter's still excited. He's raptured in the moment, but somewhat caught off guard at the second question, but still answers the same because of the company he's in. You know, he's still saying, I love you, Lord, because the disciples are watching. Everybody's listening. He doesn't want to say, I don't love you, Lord. He also doesn't want to go back into what happened three days later and remind him and everybody of his denial of the Lord. And so the third time, Jesus asks him, the thrill of the moment has receded, and all of a sudden, Peter's reminded of the darkness of the night days earlier. He feels the feelings, he hears the words coming off his tongue, I don't know him. And instantly, the third question shakes Peter to the core and reveals what's still at the bottom of Peter's heart. Shame. Shame is under all that. Yes, I love you, Lord, I'm excited, I can't believe it's you. Boom, Jesus gets to the root of what's really in his heart and says, that's still there. That's still there. It took three questions to get to that point. Now, this section of Scripture also reveals to us the trichotomy of the nature of God and the trichotomy of the nature of man. Trichotomy, trichotomy is a fancy word that just means three. Okay? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God is a trichotomy. He's got not three layers, but three distinct persons existing as one person. If you go to 1 Thessalonians 5.23... Wait for you guys to get there. I like seeing if the people with Bibles can still be faster than the people with phones. First Thessalonians 5.23. Paul says this as a prayer. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord. So Paul here prays for three parts of who you are. He says, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord. Jesus was seeking an answer from every level of Peter so that he could redeem every level of Peter. Okay? Jesus sought an answer from every level of Peter so that he could redeem every level of Peter. Spirit. Our spirits are disconnected from the Father. Jesus comes to reconnect and rewire that connection where our spirits are covered, in, our spirits are disconnected because of, of, of sin. Jesus asked Peter to reconnect his spirit. He knows he's disconnected from God because of his sin of denial. The soul, the soul part of us is where our emotions, thoughts, and feelings, our will, our desires, all that emotional stuff exists. Jesus asks and gets a response from Peter on this level, on the level of the soul. What's, what's, what's the difference between spirit and soul? Spirit is the, the part of every human brain, being that is, gives them ability to live. The, the part of God that enables blood to throw, flow through the body and the heart to beat. Every human being automatically has a spirit. You know when a person dies, they breathe their last, they exhale. I believe it's the spirit of God going out of that person. They're dying and they're just a body. Okay? The soul is the emotional, intellectual part of a person that hopefully one day begins to be influenced by the Spirit and, and our spirits become entwined with the Spirit of God. And so that intimacy starts directing our will, our desires, our emotions, our thoughts, our feelings, the soul. The soul. And then there's the body. Does that make sense? It's, yeah. It's actually a complicated answer. Yeah. Watch me knee, the Chinese... Revivalist has a book just on this verse, and I think it's about 1,200 pages, just on the spirit, soul, and body. It's, wow. you know, I, I tend to just simplify stuff and not make it too complicated, and not even run down those roads because I've done it before. Yeah. You know, it's fun, but it, it doesn't always help with godliness and becoming more like the Lord. So, spirit, soul, and flesh. Flesh refers to the effects of sin attached to our body. There's scriptures in the Old Testament where it prophesies that the Savior is going to redeem the effects of sin on the body. Which means that in Christ, sickness can get healed. Laura being healed from cancer was an effect that was, it was affecting her body and killing her body even though her soul and her spirit were alive. The body was decaying and being killed. And, and God redeemed that and healed her from that. So Jesus, just as a side note, is asking three times to show that he can redeem every layer of the human being. 
the spirit, soul, and the body of the human being. The more we spend time with God, literally, um, I have felt bodily changes in my own body by being with the Lord. I have felt stronger physically. Now shame, okay? Jesus gets to the third question, and all of a sudden we see at the bottom of Peter, there's shame because he, he gets in despair. He gets sad at the third question. All of a sudden Peter is sad, and he's, before he says, I love you, he says, Lord, you know everything. You know everything. I was hiding myself behind the crowd that night, and people would come up to me and ask me if I knew you, and I secretly said no, and you're aware of that, and I can't hide it from you. He says, you know everything, Lord. It's as if Jesus knows the first time Peter answers him out of sheer inability to think before he talks, because that was Peter. Peter would talk before he thought. Then the second time he answers him out of the simple fact that the Lord is standing face to face with him, and the sight of Jesus reminds him of his love for the Lord. Then the third time, it's as if the Lord says, Now answer me from your place of shame. This is huge. The Lord says, Answer me from your place of shame. And suddenly, we like Peter are at a crossroads. Can we answer him from such a vulnerable place? Can we answer the Lord from a vulnerable place? If yes, if we can say yes, I love you, out of our darkest shame, then we recognize the revelation of his complete redemptive work even to the core of our very own sinfulness. No matter how deep sin has gotten rooted in me, am I still able to recognize the depth at which the redemptive love of Christ can reach down to that sin and redeem it? If no, if we say no, then we devalue His redemptive work by saying His sacrifice wasn't good enough to sever the root of my deepest shame. Jesus wants to shake us out of the moment we're in so that He can get to the core of what's going on. Jesus says, I don't just want to know that you love me when it feels good or when you're in my presence or in the presence of other believers. I want to know that you love me in the cold, hard solitude of your own shame. Now this is a very interesting level to encounter Jesus at because it's almost like Jesus is saying, Peter, you can't really say that you love me until you can say it from your deepest level of humiliation. I mean, that's crazy. That's uncomfortable. We oftentimes think of Jesus as being this comfortable Savior. And we get to just go before Him and be hugged and loved on and all this stuff. And here we see a little bit of Jesus coming and saying, Let's get to the root of your junk. And let's have the conversation about my love and your love at that level. Where it's uncomfortable for you. Now I want to show you something about the love of God. He's not just about getting us uncomfortable. Okay? He's trying to show us something about how he redeems a person. Because in this interaction with Peter and Jesus, we are seeing a perfect example of Jesus redeeming someone. Of him redeeming somebody. Okay? Now me personally, if I were to look back over my past, there's plenty of dark, embarrassing, perverted moments that I wish would have never been part of my life. It's as if the enemy took a can of black spray paint and just spray painted shame all over my upbringing. And there's stuff that I'm not proud of, that I don't want to deal with. And then, it's as if the Lord came alongside me and said, let me know when you're ready to go back to every one of those instances, and I'll show you how much I loved you in those moments. Until we allow ourselves to go there with Him, we are limiting our experience of His love. We have to bring our entire past to the altar. We talked about this last week. You put the sacrifice on the altar and the whole thing gets burned. If we're holding anything back from our lives that's not on the altar, He cannot consume it. If there is a defective relationship with our father in the past or our mother in the past or somebody that hurt us and we have not put it on the altar yet, it's, I, I promise you it's still affecting your relationship with God and it's still affecting how much you've experienced the love of God. So I have to say to the Lord, Okay, even that, even that memory, even that darkness, the Lord says, bring it. Bring it into my presence. Let me show you how much I love you in that moment. There's no circumstance, there's no sin that can keep us from the love of God. There's no sin that can keep us from the love of God. But if we keep it, if we keep it and try to deal with it on our own, it goes into bitterness, shame, resentment, unforgiveness, and all that stuff just builds brick by brick and just builds a wall and hinders us from experiencing the love of God. And if you, if you ask yourself here today, 
Ask yourself here today, when is the last time I truly experienced the presence and love of God? And if you haven't, if you have a hard time answering that question, ask yourself if there's anything in your life you haven't dealt with yet. It doesn't always mean, it's not a 12-step program. It doesn't mean going and calling these people up and doing this huge moral inventory. It just means, oh, Lord, I want to tell you about that thing that happened and invite your love to cover it with your blood. Forgive me of it. And, and deal with it in His presence. So, it's it, Because until we allow ourselves to go there with Him, we are limiting our experience of His love. We bring our entire past to the altar so that our entire past can get burned up and consumed. Here's what's cool. Jesus forgets our past. It says that in the Bible. When He forgives, He forgets our past. And that's powerful. It's powerful that God can forget our past when He knows everything. But you want to know what's more powerful than that? Us forgetting our past. It's, it's true. When we come to the place where we are so enamored and so overcome by the love of God, I tell you, my thoughts about the past do become less and less. I can't say I've completely forgot about my past, but I will say that it's become less and less and less the more I'm consumed with the love of God. Now, just a side note on bondage, okay? When we're in bondage to something, it simply means that thing we're in bondage to is more powerful than we are. And the only way to be set free from it is to be overpowered by something more powerful than what we're in bondage to. Only Jesus has power over everything. If we're in bondage to anything, we need to allow the power of Jesus' love to consume that area of our lives. And He breaks, He breaks, and He severs the tie. The only weapon that has a blade sharp enough to sever the tie between us and our sin is the love of Christ. We come under the influence and power of His love and everything else loses its power. The Christian life is supposed to get, in my opinion, it's supposed to get easier. The more we get into the love of God, the more severance takes place from sin and past stuff and regrets and hang-ups, and we just get loosed. We get free. We get made free. If we're still struggling in bondage to anything, get with God. Ask Him to reveal to you how much He loves you in that area of struggle, and He will show you. Think about the woman at the well. Everybody know that story? The woman at the well? This is interesting. Jesus is at the well. He's thirsty. The woman goes to the well to get water. They start talking. Jesus all of a sudden tells her everything about her current situation, everything about her past, and it was ugly. It was all about adultery. It was all about lust and all kinds of stuff. And Jesus says, I know all that. Do we know what He knows? Do we know that He knows and still loves us despite what He knows? Jesus knows everything about us. Am I aware of the fact that He knows everything about my life and yet still loves me despite what He knows? Jesus' knowledge of this woman's secrets actually set her free. So Peter, here on the beach with the other disciples, Jesus gets to the root of his shame and his knowledge of Peter's shame is not to expose him, it's to help him get redeemed and recovered. Because this woman, right after this encounter with Jesus, he tells her all her secrets, uncovers her sin, and then she goes and runs throughout the whole town and tells everybody about it. Do you think a shameful person would do that? Nobody goes throughout town and just says, I was just told all this stuff that's wrong with my life and all this stuff I'm doing by the Lord. The only way she could have done that, the only way she could have done that, is that as Jesus revealed this stuff to her, she also encountered His love for her despite those things. So she doesn't leave with shame. She leaves with love. And this is how you know you are encountering the Lord genuinely, is you will never leave His presence feeling shameful. You will not leave His presence feeling condemned. If you go into prayer and you're reading the Word, and you come away from the Word and prayer feeling shameful and condemnation, you didn't encounter God. It didn't happen. And He's there. He's always there. God is there. God does not leave us. He does not forsake us. It's something. If there's a disconnect, it's something on our end. When we truly encounter God, like this woman at the well, we will feel redeemed. We will feel not shameful. We will feel loved. It's very simple evidence of who we're spending time with. Did I go into my prayer closet and spend time with my own thoughts? 
in my own junk or did I actually unload that stuff and experience the tangible love of the Father and left that stuff at the altar? You know? I mean, in the Catholic Church, people have the priest. You get, you get to go to the priest and unload that stuff in a, in a room. In Christianity, you actually get to go before the Father and unload that stuff on Him and He actually take it, takes it. He really takes it. And He says, now I don't remember that anymore. And then you mess up again. You know what it says in 1 John? For those of you who fall again, get up, ask forgiveness, and we have an advocate continually seeking and forgiving us on behalf of the Father. Continually. 1 John. Now, back to Jesus as, as a Redeemer. Jesus gets to the root of Peter, knowing that if there's one thing that could take Peter out of the ministry before Peter starts serving Jesus, Jesus knows that if there's one thing that could uproot him that the enemy could use in the future, it'll be those moments of denial. And he'll go back to that shame and he'll be rendered useless in the kingdom of God. So I have to get to that. I have to get to that root. I have to expose it, pluck it out and redeem it so that Peter won't be taken down in the future. <clears throat> so Jesus goes to that place right there on the shore of Galilee and he says, let's deal with it. In an instant, Peter's confronted with a very heavy choice. Do I go back there and let my shame define me? Or am I man enough to stand here face to face with the Lord of the universe, the one who knows everything about me, and declare, you know what? I believe your love is greater than my shame, greater than my sin, greater than my rebellion. As a matter of fact, I do love you, Lord. And that's what Jesus was after. Jesus was after that. Can you be aware of the stuff that makes you feel shameful and encounter me in that moment and still say you love me? Because it's at that point that you're ready to serve me. Because you've now not only comprehended the love of God, but you've tasted it and you've experienced it in the depths of your heart that God loves you. Nobody will be able to tell Peter different from that moment. And nobody could. Peter was threatened for his life. They said, we're going to crucify you. We're going to put you to death if you don't stop speaking about Jesus. And he says, I don't care. I'm not the same man. Because back on the beach, Jesus asked me three times. He got to my denial and I was forgiven of all that. He redeemed it. So as a matter of fact, crucify me upside down. I'm not even worthy to be crucified ups, upside, right side up, in the same way my Lord was crucified. That's a different man. Peter went on to preach on the day of Pentecost. After experiencing the love and fire of Jesus, over 3,000 people were saved during his sermon. 3,000 people don't get convinced and follow somebody who is not believably in love with Jesus, and they could see it in his eyes, they could hear it in his voice, that Jesus was legitimately a man after God's heart. Peter says, you know what? I believe your love is greater than my shame. I do love you, Lord. And that's the coolest thing about this verse. The third time, it says, Peter is saddened. Peter is grieved. And then, he says, you know everything, but I do still love you. I love you. And then Peter says, okay. Let's do it. Let's, let's do the kingdom of God together. You're ready. You've allowed me to go to that place in you so I can redeem it. The very perversion or sin or evil that the devil used to try and destroy you, Jesus lovingly identifies. He identifies it because of his love, not because he wants to embarrass us or put us on the spot. He identifies it so that he can cover it with his blood and so that we can be aware that it's been covered by his blood. And there in that moment, redemption becomes a partnership because the Lord can only redeem what we allow Him to. He can only cleanse us from what we are willing to loosen from our grip. Jesus says, let's wipe it from the record. I won't remember it anymore. So redemption is a partnership. Jesus wants to redeem all of us, spirit, soul, body. But if we hold anything back, we are building a wall and we're, we're hindering Jesus from being able to encounter us in that vulnerable place and redeem us. And that's one of the greatest gifts. It's the greatest thing I've ever felt is being able to bring my whole past and all my stuff into the presence of the Lord and actually be freed from it. It doesn't come through counseling. It doesn't come through a degree. It doesn't come through anybody else. It comes from a one-on-one -on -one encounter with Jesus on the shore of Galilee that each of us, each of us, has to have or continue to have every day of our lives. We have to be confronting the redemptive love of Jesus every single day of our lives. And it's very simple for me. I either encounter the love of God on a daily basis or I carry my own stuff around and we get exhausted, tired, and burned out and angry and depressed and all the stuff that goes with that. 
okay? And I don't want to carry it. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but depression's not running in my heart. Depression's not running in my family because if I'm continually before the Lord experiencing His love, how can depression be there? How can it be there? When I was a chaplain in Boston working with schizophrenic people and bipolar people and depressed, depressed people, there is a place for medicine. But there were times when I got to go into a room with these people and be one-on-one -on -one with them and encounter them and look into their eyes and reveal the love of God to them and see them get freed in an instant from that depression and be dismissed from that hospital without any meds. Okay, I couldn't follow up with these people, but I, I did see the effect of the presence of God in a person who struggled. And I've had that in my own life. The more we encounter the love of God, stuff falls off of us. Stuff falls off of us. And please hear me. Anybody in this room on medication for anything, I am not telling you not to take that medication. That's not what I'm saying, okay? I'm just saying for me personally, the love of God has been the greatest medicine I've ever had for any of my junk, okay? For me. Now one last question I want to ask is, can we measure the love of God? Can we measure the love of God? Some say we can't. Some say there's no way to to really comprehend and measure the love of God. But, I want to argue that a little bit. Paul prayed something for saints that begs to differ. While we may not ever be able to fully understand it, I do think there is a way to measure the depths at which the love of God has touched us personally. Go to Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. Very cool verse. Paul says, So I kneel humbly in awe before the Father. I'll give you guys a couple more minutes. Sorry about that. I can't remember. Is it Old Ephesians? Uh, New Testament Ephesians? Chapter 3, New Testament. It's after the Gospels. Yes. Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. <clears throat> Here's the thing. People can tell us about the love of God all day long. I've had seasons of life where people have told me about the love of God when I've been in very dark, struggling times, and it didn't do a thing. There had to be a genuine encounter in my personal life of the love of God until I could finally say, you know what? I've been there. I've tasted it. I know what it's like now. I know how much God loves me for me. And not even I can stand up here and, and preach about this. Every, everybody in this room has to have their own encounter with the love of God. This is why Paul prayed for this. Paul prayed for this. So I kneel humbly, and, I, and I'm reading from a version that's a little more expanded, okay? So I kneel humbly in awe before the Father of our Lord Jesus the Messiah, the perfect Father of every father, and child in heaven and on the earth. And I pray that He would unveil within you the unlimited riches of His glory and favor, until supernatural strength floods your innermost being with His divine might and explosive power. Then by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside you, and the resting place of His love will become the very source and root of your life. When Christ gets to the depths of a person and His love becomes the root of the way we live life, we live victoriously. It's a whole other way of living. We live from the root of His love. Then you will be empowered to discover what every Holy One experiences. The great and, and there's the word, experience, okay? We are talking about feeling and experiencing the tangible love of God. This is not just an intellectual thing. We can feel this. Then you will be empowered to discover what every Holy One experiences, the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions. How deeply intimate and far-reaching is, is His love. How enduring and inclusive it is. Endless love beyond measurement that transcends your understanding. This extravagant love pours into you until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. According to Ephesians, we can experience the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions. 
How do we know? The depths to which we've opened ourselves up to God is the depth at which we've experienced His love. How, how, deep, how deep have we allowed God to go? And I'm telling you, if we are scared, if we're scared to go deep with God, all I can say is don't be scared. Don't be scared. Let, let Him go to these places in your heart because it's amazing how much He loves you as a father, as a perfect father. One area I feel the Lord continually going to me on is, is my thoughts and feelings towards my own father. Okay, that's a very difficult area for me still. I have to continually take this area of my life before the Lord and say, love me in this, these feelings and help me to love my dad. It's, you know, not all of us have easy stuff to work out with the Lord, but it's, it is rewarding. It is rewarding. We either keep carrying it around or we give it to Him and we get freedom from it. Yeah, I can relate to that one. You know? Easy. My dad was an alcoholic and used it yeah. and everything. And like you said, that for years up until, uh, like I told you, when the Lord made a visitation on our church and everything, did I ever get free from it. Mm -hmm. And then he turned it around from my hate for my dad to my love for my dad. But it went through a process. Yeah. And it's possible. It's, it's possible. very possible. Yeah, yeah. what you have to do, like you say, is yeah. surrender and be willing to go there. Mm -hmm. And just let Him love on you, let Him yeah. take you through. <clears throat> yep. Yeah. And then, I tell you what, the, the, the experiential love of God is the only way to live. Amen. It's the only way to live. Laura and I cannot live one day outside the love of God. We can't. How deep have we allowed the love of God to penetrate our hearts, our minds, our memories, our feelings? Have we given the love of God access to the deepest parts of us? Here's something cool. Okay, You can't escape the love of God. Psalm 139 verse 8 says, Even in the depths of Sheol, God, you are there. Yeah. Sheol was a Hebrew word used to describe the deepest, darkest uh, place of hell, place of death. David says, even if I ran away from you into that place, you'd still find me. You'd still be there. As dark and as deep as we can go, Boom, at the bottom of it all is Jesus because He already redeemed the bottom. He already redeemed death. You can't go away from His presence. You can't run anywhere. The only place to go is into His love. It's the only place to go. So why not surrender ourselves to His love and see what happens? And many of us in this room, we have. But that surrender is a daily thing. It's a daily thing. I want to close with just three verses. Romans 5.5 5. Three verses that Repeat what I've been saying today. And this hope is not a disappointing fantasy because we can now experience the endless love of God cascading into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. 2 Thessalonians 3.5 Let me ask you guys something. Even though I have it up on the screen, you guys prefer I, I wait for you to get it in your own translations because I can do that. Okay. 2 Thessalonians 3.5 Oh, he did? Is that why he came down? It worked. It still works. <laughs> I tell you, man, God whistles for every one of us every morning. I thought that was so it's funny. Like, I appreciate it. It does. I know, he looked down here like, what's going on? Like, what's going on? <laughs> Second Thessalonians 3.5 now may the Lord move your hearts into a greater understanding of God's pure love for you and into Christ's steadfast endurance. These are just a few citations, okay? All throughout the New Testament, it's a common prayer for us to experience the love of God. It's one of the deepest prayers of the apostles that we would know the love of God. 1 John 3.1 1 John 3, 1. First John 3, 1. Look with wonder at the depth of the Father's marvelous love that He has lavished on us. He has called us and made us His very own beloved children. That word in Greek, look, means to look. 
It means to look. It means today I'm going to wake up and I'm going to look for the love of God. I'm going to be on the lookout for it. I'm not going to look for negative stuff. I'm not going to look and keep, keep my eyes on myself and all the stuff that's wrong with me sometimes. I'm going to keep on the lookout for the love of God until I can look in the mirror at myself and love myself as much as God loves me. Now, at the close of this, what Laura and I want to do is we want to just play a song <clears throat> for you guys um, about the love of God, about interacting with Him in intimacy. And we just want to give an opportunity for you guys to pray in your, on your own, or you can get on your knees, you can um, stay in your chairs, you can stand up, whatever you'd like to do. But you have full access to God. Let Him love on you. Just give yourself an opportunity to be loved on by God today. Whether you feel, whether you walk out of here feeling Him or not, it doesn't matter. There will be a change. I've come many times to an altar or a church service where people were all around me getting touched by God and feeling God, and I didn't feel God whatsoever. And it's okay. It doesn't mean God doesn't love you. Okay? We just want to give Him opportunity. We want to give Him room to touch us as much as we can. Because we believe God is so eagerly whistling for us and wanting to hug us, wanting to wrap His arms around us and say, I want to do life with you. Come on, let's do this. Let's do life together. Okay, so we want to play a song for you. However you're comfortable, have your own personal time with the Lord as best you can as we're, as we're all together. Nobody's judging each other. Nobody's looking at you. Um, Laura and I are available to pray for anybody for an increase of the love of God in your life. If you would like prayer, as the song starts going, just raise your hand. If you'd like prayer, that way we're not praying for anybody who doesn't want to be prayed for. Okay? So if you'd like prayer, raise your hand, we'll pray for you. And we'll listen to the song together. Turn that right down. Yes, please.
thank you for every person here. I humble myself before you, acknowledge your mighty power, your amazing love that I can't live without. And I pray for each person here today that they would leave in the mighty fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And they would leave knowing how much they're cared for by their Father. They follow these people wherever they go, Lord. As they walk home or drive home, Lord, your presence go with them. And that they would be aware this week of how much they are accepted and loved unconditionally because of the blood of Christ that has redeemed us from ourselves. It's such a joyful, joyful place to live life from. It's not based on me and my own performance. It's based on your love for me, Lord. And I apprehend that love. I acknowledge that love and say, Jesus, I love you. I do love you. I do love you. I answer you out of my place of weakness, and I say I do love you. And I bless, I bless these people, Lord. I thank you for them. Thank you for their hearts. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter where we worship. It doesn't even matter if the worship's good or bad or if it sounds good. It doesn't matter if the message is good or bad. It matters about the hearts of your people, whether they are hungry and ripe and humble enough to sense and feel your presence. And so, God, I just thank you for every heart here. I pray that you would move, Lord. Move even more into deeper levels of intimacy in every person here today. I thank you for them. And release the joy of the Lord on you guys today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Be blessed. You guys need anything? Let us know. Stick around for drinks if you want, muffins, scones, whatever. You need prayer for anything? I do. Let's pray for you. Tyler's got a big week. Yeah. In the car where they've got like first cheer competition. Oh, wow. Okay. For the high school, and they're also interviewing for the head coach position. Oh, wow. Finally. Wow. And that's been heavy on my heart. To bring a good man to them. Absolutely. Because they've had a rough four years. Yeah. Not having consistency and not having guidance. You're getting a new coach, or a new coach is being interviewed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need a good coach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for your cheer and football. Yeah. Okay. Let's pray. Lord, I bless Tyler and Carly. I bless them, Lord. May this next upcoming week be filled with your glory. May it be filled with your glory. May there be the peace and comfort of the Holy Spirit on everything that pertains to this upcoming week. May they be at rest. May they have confidence and full assurance knowing who their Lord is, knowing that their lives are orchestrated by your love. Bless Tyler. May he walk in your paths. May he direct his steps. And bless Carla. May she walk in the paths, direct her steps. And I say, Lord, provide an amazing individual to coach this football team. Lord, we ask in faith, provide an amazing individual who's humble and a powerful leader. A powerful leader who's able to bring a team together with the skill of football and with the anointing of your spirit. Lord, I pray for a godly person. I pray for a godly person who knows how to develop the leadership and the gold in those players and not just teach them how to play football, but actually make a mark on their life to help them discover who they're supposed to be. I pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray that in you, Lord God, she would become alive, fully alive to you, Lord, in her. And I thank you for her heart, Lord. I thank you for, Lord, the mother that she is. Strengthen her, Lord, as a mother. Give her the wisdom and the discernment. Oh, hallelujah.